almost every profession has gone through an industrial revolution. When spreadsheets were in, introduced, legal work in some ways is still a bit of a cottage industry. Welcome to Tech Talks, hosted by myself, David Savage, and powered by Nash Squared. Today's guest is David Wong, the Chief Product Officer at Thomson Reuters from Toronto in Canada. But before that, I'm joined by Akish. How are you? Hello, I'm very well. I'm very well, thank you. Akish, uh, name something you might be drinking a lot of over the next few weeks, if you're, if you're quite well to do. Champagne. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. I, think, I think I needed to add that if you're quite well to do, otherwise it could have been like, I don't know, white lightning. <laughs> cider <laughs> or for our american listeners because we have quite a lot of them eggnog is oh god no that always sounds horrible i'm not at it maybe it's not but they drink a lot of eggnog don't they every christmas that and... sounds like it's got the, the the potential to go horribly wrong yeah i think so any bad gut uh yeah 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 uh, yeah well, I mentioned this right because I was I was um, having a scan through Wired and spotted an article that they published a little while ago that I thought is is quite appropriate for the season. What makes a champagne vintage great? Mm. Ask a deep learning model. Is there nothing that data and deep learning can't tell us? Basically, they're using data to have a look at weather patterns and try and basically work out what year is going to be a vintage year. That is that is sensational. That is so good, isn't it? I mean, it's basically it's all these years of mastery, you know, absolute sort of farming or not farming, but like, you know, vineyard traditions and all that. And now we've just got a deep model that just will tell us and it will tell any random person that's probably got no understanding or no clue of, you know, how it goes from grapes to a bottle and then into our glasses. But you know, they know when a vintage year may be. I mean, there's there's part of this article that talks about the fact that, you know, the only parameters that really count are those determined by the nose and mouth, mm. right? And on taste metrics, basically this was all about, um, in 2021, they opened a Grand Anne 2014. Like, all the weather conditions came together in 2014 for it to be an amazing, amazing year. It launched to market um, mm. in 2022 at £585 a case in the UK. And it's proven to be a hit, a fresh, elegant, mineral, tempered um, departure from Bollinger's full-bodied norm with plenty of further ageing potential, which is what kind of wine critics said. 98 out of 100 they gave it. But whilst those conclusions around taste is is obviously a very personal thing, mm. data can help them decide which years could have the right conditions to produce something that people will go gaga over. Yeah, and that is so smart. That's that's pretty amazing. And I think just having something like that, which allows us to learn about these models and and you know the way things will work, is mind blowing. Yeah, I, I'm, yeah, absolutely. I'd, I'd I'd love to work out what they don't know, if that makes sense. <laughs> but, but I don't, well, I don't think there is anything to be honest. You you say that. Uh, today's guest, um, David, as we've said, um, Thomson Reuters, they have a report out exploring AI and productivity. Productivity is one thing that, that the industry still seems to be getting its head around and mm. doesn't necessarily know. So, you know, productivity very much on the lips of everyone. What does the data actually tell us about productivity and working patterns? So let's dive into that because that is an area that definitely people don't have all the answers on. Um, we'll be back afterwards. Today, I'm joined by David Wong, uh, Chief Product Officer at Thomson Reuters. How are you today? Very good. Very, very nice to be here uh, to speak to you, David. Uh, and I was just saying before I hit record that you're normally in Toronto, but you find yourself in Zurich at the minute. What, what are you doing over there? Oh, well, our European headquarters are here in uh, Zurich. So I've just been with the entire leadership team of Thomson Reuters over the past week, uh, talking about the future of professionals and AI. So it's uh, timely that I get a chance to speak to you. I've got all the latest, latest <laughs> for you and your, your audience. Well, it's a beautiful place to be. Um, look, you said there that the whole leadership team of Thomson Reuters. I think Thomson Reuters is one of those brands that even if people aren't 
necessarily that clear about exactly what you do. They're kind of vaguely, oh, well, I think I think they do X. So let's clear that up. Let's make sure that people really do know <laughs> what Thomson Reuters do. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, it's funny. Everybody knows what Reuters is. And particularly of the past couple of weeks, our uh, journalists have been doing incredible work out to cover the conflicts and wars in the world. But the work that I focus on is on everything other than the news. So 90% of our business is serving, serving professionals. So we provide software, content, data that help professionals, namely lawyers, accountants, and risk professionals to do their jobs and to make better decisions uh, and to support the companies that they uh, companies and clients that they ultimately uh, they ultimately serve. So that is 90% of our business and has been for probably now uh, a good good 30, 40 years uh, of Thomson Reuters history. And look, you you mentioned obviously that there's conflict going on. Everyone is well aware that the world is in a fairly fragile place at the moment. Risk is something that I imagine a lot of organisations are really having to contend with because of the uh, macro but also microeconomic conditions that they find themselves in. And absolutely, risk in all different forms: legal risk, tax risk, compliance, and of course physical, uh, physical and political risk as well. And so, the work of professionals is n- probably more important than ever. Uh, in the world because of uh, what's going on. And you've got a a future professionals report that's recently out. Is that right? Uh, That's right. And I'm excited to to, to share a little bit today about that, uh, about that report. Thomson Reuters, we commissioned a study over the past three or four months to survey professionals to ask them, ask them about the future of their work, the trends that are affecting uh, their professions. And uh, again, the vision for where everything is going and, uh, we have done this many years. We've done this uh, in previous years, but this year's report has been quite a bit different. Uh, the trends have changed radically, uh, and uh, the views have started to change quite radically. Look, with any report, obviously the the, the, the sample size makes a big difference. Um, when yeah. we're saying future professionals, it's quite quite a broad group of people. I mean, who are we talking about? Who have you gone out and spoken to, and what kind of size no, or numbers of people are we talking about? Yeah, that's a good question. So we, we surveyed our, our customer, our customer base, which focuses on tax professionals, on legal professionals across firms. So that would include law firms and accounting firms, as well as corporations and the government. And we ended up surveying uh, around 1,200 professionals, generally in more senior positions, about their opinions uh, about the, the future of their work. And so we have quite a good cross-section across North America, Europe, and Asia across different levels of seniority and, again, across tax, legal, and uh, government and risk work. And as chief product officer then, how does what they're telling you affect your role and and your view of the world? Because I assume that we might be thinking about external products with regards to tax and law. I might be wrong. It's just interesting to know how that then kind of flows into what you're doing. Well, I couldn't do my work without this research. So I'm so, so excited by these findings and how quickly things are changing because at the end of the day, our product teams can only build what our customers need if we understand those needs. And with things changing so quickly, we have to do this type of research. So it directly feeds into the work we do. We always start with what's the biggest customer problem? What is the ultimate need of the marketplace? And so uh, it couldn't come at a better time because we have been quickly shifting our priorities to respond to uh, the, the, the findings from the, the study and the, and the report. Well, look, let, let's ask the obvious question then. What are the needs of your customers right now? We've described that the world is complex for them and, and a huge amount of different kind of, uh, I, I suppose, angles to be thinking about. What's coming through from the report? So I know we've kind of buried the lead. We've talked about the report, but uh, the the... The single biggest finding from the report is the role of AI, the role of AI in transforming professional work. Uh, We've always asked the question, what are the big trends? What do you see is affecting the the work with professionals over the previous years? But this year, when we did the study, AI rose to the top over three times higher reported as a trend that would transform professions. And it was quite unanimous uh, across different professions as well. And so it was a very clear signal that nearly every professional that we serve, tax, legal, government, risk, believes that AI, and in particular generative AI, is going to, just, is going to transform their professions over the next five to 10 years. Uh, and so that, again, came screaming through the report. 
And uh, it wasn't just uh, a general view that AI would, would impact their work. It was on a number of different dimensions. It was on number one, around the productivity of the work, the nature of work that's done. Uh, our customers also believe that it would change their business models, that over the course of five to 10 years, the actual value exchange with their customers and their clients would change. And it would also change the way they have to operate. Uh, there was a, a, significant, a significant outcry for responsible, responsible AI, that with the advent of this technology, there would be a shift in the way that tools had to be used, business practices, ethics, uh, as well as legal frameworks around how all these uh, these products are used. So again, it hit in many different dimensions, not just, oh, it's going to change us, but it's going to change uh, professionals in all of these different ways. Look, it's interesting that clearly the sentiment is there from people that this is going to be transformative. And I'm sure it will, but it does also kind of make us question, well, how? We're very excited about generative AI, but AI has existed, machine learning has existed for quite some time. What is different now? How are these technologies actually being implemented business, by businesses to drive that impact? Yeah, uh, this, is, this is a question which we have been digging into over the past, past year. And I think legal is a great place to start to, to examine this question. And the how that we see in legal is pretty unique because the legal industry has looked at the use of technology for years and years, decades, to see if you could get more productivity, new, more use of, of technology in the way that law is practiced. And I would argue the biggest innovation or the biggest innovations that hit the legal, legal industry in the past 20 years have been email and Microsoft Word. Uh, and so not, not dramatic changes. These are tools which obviously save time, but not dramatic changes in the way that work is done. Not like data, uh, data systems, databases, and spreadsheets for tax professionals. And so it's a long way of saying this is generative AI may be the technology which finally creates dramatic productivity change within legal work because it has the potential to automate and to uh, to accelerate work in a way that uh, no other previous technology was able to do. This uh, the way that I sometimes talked about it is that almost every profession's gone through an industrial revolution when spreadsheets were in, introduced. Tax and financial work went through an industrial revolution away from a cottage industry. Legal work, in some ways, is still a bit of a cottage industry. Better tools like uh, like email and Word and uh, and access to research, but the actual production of legal legal work product um, is still uh, done by by individuals. And uh, generative AI has a chance to uh, to to meaningfully increase production productivity of those individuals. Are you concerned about any kind of potential knowledge gap? Because it's all very well saying, you know, this this tool in the hand of individuals is transformative. Of, of course it is. But when we're talking about legal processes, what you don't want is a situation where someone is using it and looking at what they're getting back from generative AI and not questioning it. You know, if we think about the, the medical industry, um, hallucinations within generative AI are a, a, a real issue. Is, is that message there? Do legal professionals using these tools understand that perhaps what then they're getting back is not to be wholly trusted at the minute and needs a little bit of um, massaging? Uh, absolutely. And I think that's why I say that it has the potential to transform the legal industry. Those questions are right, right in the front of every legal professional. Uh, can I trust the results? Is it going to give me true efficiency? Because if I have to double check everything, I'm not going to get real efficiency because uh, it'll just be a bit of a parlor trick that I'll have to double check. And so uh, you're, you're spot on that addressing hallucination, making sure that systems have trust and that they can be used productively are at the heart of the product problems that we're trying to solve right now. Uh, and I think hallucination is the first place to start. Um, we uh, at Thomson Reuters have been looking at techniques to essentially teach AI to say, I don't know. Uh, and, and I think we've been quite successful. Uh, if you look at some of the work we've been doing uh, with uh, Westlaw uh, and uh, some of the, the recent announcements we've had around case text, uh, we have created research 
products which uh, almost entirely eliminate hallucination uh, by, uh, again, enabling the AI to say, hmm, I didn't find anything on that topic. I don't know, uh, instead of, of asking the systems to make things up. I think the, uh, the other... Uh, the, the other thing that I would, I would look at here is uh, there is a significant conversation happening around uh, best practices and, uh, and professional norms. So uh, the ethics of using the products are also, uh, are also being debated right now to make sure that, uh, uh, for example, a uh, trained lawyer is always inspecting and reviewing the results of these systems, that you're not just taking things at face value that come out of the systems. It's interesting there that you bring up best practices and norms. You also talked about the responsible use of AI a little bit earlier on in the in the conversation. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we, we referenced the fact you're in Zurich at the moment, um, but you're normally based in North America. And Thomson Reuters, I, am I right in thinking, have quite a big presence in New York. Um, how do you see the differences in terms of those best practices and norms and that approach towards AI between where you are right now, sitting in Europe? Okay, not not in the EU, but surrounded by the EU, uh, and also North America. Is that diverging, or are you seeing some some um, kind of, I suppose, joined-up thinking coming through? Um, I think if we look across the different jurisdictions, the principles which are being used across, let's say, Canada, the US, the UK, and the EU are actually quite similar. Uh, the, the AI principles that are at the heart of the, the conversation are common uh, as, as we look across those different jurisdictions. I think the data privacy principles are also quite common. Uh, and even if you ask bar associations and uh, legal organizations, they're, they're quite similar. So I think they, they, that uh, the starting place is quite, quite similar. I think the progress and the execution is at different paces. I think that uh, professional organizations in the U.S., I think, have taken a... a, a uh, a first step. I think we're seeing more rulemaking uh, and advice coming from bar associations uh, and from uh, professional organizations. I think the government in the EU and in the UK have taken a stronger position on AI and have started to form frameworks there. But uh, I think that's more of a speed of execution. The principles, uh, I think, are actually quite similar between different jurisdictions. And in terms of those professionals themselves, it's interesting. I was talking to the head of the CTA, um, Gary Shapiro, um, not too long ago, and he was saying there seems to be a far greater um, kind of positive sentiment towards AI in North America than, than in Europe. So I suppose that lag between what you're just talking about there in terms of how... Um, kind of over, overarching organizations and, and frameworks might be kind of putting put in place at different speeds it's still probably going to be behind the pace of, of customers do you see there being a difference between your customers in the u.s and your customer or uh, in north america rather and your customers here in europe um i think we actually see quite consistent uh, eagerness and excitement on the customer side for users uh across the uk the u.s and canada uh, it's, it's generally, I think we've generally found that the UK as a legal in this, a legal market has been the most innovative. They typically adopt technology first. Um, and so I think what we see is that end users, so the law firms and the corporate law departments, I think are all chopping at the bit uh, to, to try to experiment, to, to, uh, to use the different tools. I think that uh, the, the regulatory agencies in the different, uh, in the different jurisdictions are taking a different, different tack that, uh, in the EU and the UK, there's been a little bit more of a of a conservative approach to AI, and in the US, uh, a little bit more of a laissez-faire um, uh, on the regulatory side. Look, as a, as a chief product officer, then there's a huge there's it's, look, it's a complex picture, lots of moving parts. What do you or what occupies the the vast majority of your time when you're thinking about these issues right now, as as a chief product officer? Yeah, the. I think number one is what's the the most valuable thing that we can build for our customers. There is so much hype right now around generative AI, and when we start to do the hard work of applying it to problems and seeing what is valuable and what is not, um, our hypotheses are sometimes proved true and sometimes proved not true. And uh, that that is the hard work that that I and my teams are doing more than anything else right now. That we're trying to experiment to build 
capabilities and skills for customers to use and then to see what works. Uh, because I think many of our customers, professionals across tax, across legal, across risk, are looking to companies like Thomson Reuters to say, hey, figure this out. Um, I, uh, I'm not quite sure how we can apply this. Uh, can you do some of that, that hard, hard work to, to see uh, the best applications? And so that is that's naturally what, what uh, our teams are doing. It's what gets me excited about the, the opportunity. And um, uh, I'm excited to share more as we launch new products because I think we found some really exciting use cases. You know, uh, I've always said to our customers, generative AI is so exciting because it does two things really well. It helps to retrieve information really well, and it helps to produce written work products really well. And if you ask, you know, uh, if you ask TR, Thomson Reuters, what our products do, they typically do those two things. Our research products, they help you find information and our, our work product uh, assistance helps to create written work product. And it, it is, uh, it would be shocking if generative AI could not help us to be able to do those things better. And so that's why it's so exciting for, for us right now. We spoke a little bit about the appetites around um, generative AI here. But what does, it, what does it mean for people's careers? Because obviously there's the concern that as people begin to utilize generative AI, that might mean less opportunity for people. Yes, there is the opportunity for it to be a great tool from efficiency, but perhaps not as many people will be needed. What, what's your reading? Yeah, there's. Uh, you also alluded to this point uh, in, in one of your other questions around uh, what is, what is the role of the experienced professional? And so there's a big question of how do you become an experienced professional when you've got AI assistance? And so uh, in general, we found that professionals are responding in two ways. Number one, that they see generative AI as an augmentation to professionals, that it's not a replacement. It is helping to augment specific tasks for, for professionals. And also that the type of of apprenticeship that you need in, in professional work is still necessary uh, so that you can get the skills, the context, the experience to be able to judge what these systems are producing. So what that all means is the career path will look very different, that new professionals going into the industry will not only need to know their professional space, but now will become or have to become much more technology and AI savvy. And that is a dramatic shift. If you think about what they teach in law school or when you do an accounting degree, uh, it has to go beyond the content. It has to go beyond the, the, the academic work and much more into the applied. And I think that that is something that institutions are not ready uh, for or set up to do quite yet. But uh, it's clear that in five to 10 years, the next batch of law school graduates will have to know how to use AI and to have the savvy to know when it, can it be trusted, when can it uh, not be trusted, when is it useful, when is it not use, useful, uh, and to incorporate that into their legal work. And I think the same for other professionals. I, I assume that your report has not surveyed professors, lecturers, and so on from, from academia. However, it may well have spoken to people who are working with education um, sectors. How, how are they trying to help bridge that gap and, and make sure that people do come into the industry with the right skill set? Well, I think there's always a robust conversation that happens between leaders of professional firms and educational and, and academic institutions. So I think what we're hearing is as leaders of law firms, what is it that law schools around you know, the world should be thinking about as they adapt and develop curriculum for the future? And so I think it's the beginning of a conversation, but it's clear from our report that uh, there is a need to rethink the the professional development path all the way from year one of 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 uh, of, of college or university to uh, partnership at a at a firm, and that entire path is going to get changed and augmented over the next five to ten years. Quickly before we uh, before we let you go, I know that you've got limited time in Switzerland. Hopefully, you do enjoy what time you've got left. Uh, if someone wants to find out a bit more about the report, they can go to thomsonreuters.com, Correct. That's correct. You can download the Future Professionals Report right there. And we'll put a specific link as well in the show notes that anyone who's got their phone in their hand right now can click on. Uh, but enjoy the rest of your time there and have a safe trip home. All right. Thank you, David. 
Right, Keish, um, earlier today I sent you a news article um, mm-hmm. from Sky News about Spotify. Have you had a chance to have a look at it? I have had a chance to look at it, yes. Yes, I have. Um, yeah. Right, what, what are your thoughts? Give, give us a quick praise and, and tell, us, tell us what you think. Um, so, obviously, we all know who Spotify are. Um, huge music streaming platform um been around for years where, where you can listen to this podcast you can we, we, where you can listen to this podcast actually yeah correct um but i think it was basically um they were in their third round of um cuts and making changes to the workforce and as a result of that around 150 jobs i think this time around um were going to be Fif- at risk. 1,500, 1,500. 1,500, sorry. 1500 yeah, there's, there's a zero there. There's an extra uh, zero. Sorry about is... that. Yeah, poor maths. Um, <laughs> and 17% of its total workforce, despite, yeah. despite, um, I think, the, the prices or membership going up this year. So so uh, they've, they're cutting, yeah, up to nearly 20% of its workforce, 17%, as you said, um, despite earning £55 million worth of profit in mm. their latest report and more subscribers on the platform. And basically, again, it's this um, balancing act um, between uh, profit Mm. and efficiency. Mm. Uh, And suggesting that even more cuts might come in 2024 and 2025. Is this another sign, basically, that companies potentially, during and in the, the immediate aftermath of the pandemic, overhired? I'm. I've got two. I've got two. Um, well, schools of thought. Number one is is I agree with you. Uh, the overhiring, and the the sort of, you know, maybe the over zealous sort of expectation of you know expansion and 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 kind of, you know, um, I guess the growth phase that they wanted to get into. But my second thing is, and I'm gonna sound. I mean, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I, I won't sound qualified to be a co-host on the technology podcast here, but not true. But thank you. <laughs> uh, but I actually, th- I actually don't know how much more they can diversify their service or their product. Like, and 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 again, I'm, I mean, I'm no, I'm not Daniel Ek, and I'm no think tank, and I've watched the Spotify documentary, which, by the way, on mm. Netflix is is fantastic, and it's a great watch. I recommend everyone to watch it, and I'm all about this story, but. You kind of look at Spotify and you go, well, you know, how else are you going to commercialize things? You know, because, I mean, they don't want to go in the video streaming side. I mean, that's all tied down by Netflix, really, and Amazon Prime and, and these. And to an extent, YouTube. And YouTube, yeah. So music, sound and, and podcasts is sort of where they're at. I mean, I, 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 I personally think the reason is they've, they've hired a load of people. They paid a shit ton of money out. And then they've actually realized that maybe we should just keep you know the ones that are keeping us going and keeping us live and fresh and possibly yeah. i think you know concentrate on research but that's what i think anyway i also think that they've probably over invested in so they've spent a billion dollars to build up their podcast business hmm. and part of that has included signing up celebrities like kim Kardashian. the article states harry megan hmm. um was Joe Rogan, some Joe of Rogan. podcast yeah, over Joe exclusively Rogan. to Spotify, yeah. and the yeah. audience shrank. Probably unsurprisingly, because Spotify is a really big platform, but it is a, you know, if you're not if you're not a Spotify member, like it used to be, be just on YouTube for anybody to watch. Um, yeah. So you're gonna you're gonna, like, yeah. you're gonna cut the audience to a degree. Like us, I'm not a Spotify customer. You are. No, I am. And yeah. yeah, so I, exactly. I listen on Spotify. You listen on Apple. And yeah, exactly. And and uh, you know when I used to listen to the Joe Rogan podcast, I used to listen to a couple of other podcasts that then got purely signed by Spotify. Uh, mm-hmm. One person that you know I think you uh, also like his stuff. Uh, for example, Ben Foster, um, ex footballer, you know goalkeeper, yep. great podcast, all these sorts of things. They, they used to be on YouTube. Um, used to watch them on there, but then it went straight to exclusively on pod, uh, on Spotify. And but I don't watch the, 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 the podcast market is growing, and they they mm. expect you know you look at the the you look at the uh, forecast for Spotify and their growth, and they are growing 
Mm. ridiculous secret i think they've gone what from 300 the, the article talks about kind of 300 million ish subscribers mm. last year so about 600 million this year they're aiming to hit a billion mm. and if they if that's the case then it's working right yeah. but maybe that this is just a okay we spent a lot to 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 start to generate that movement yeah but we can't continue to spend at those level levels and it's almost like we've made that big push yeah now it's time to i don't know it's, it'd be really interesting to know because i spotify is obviously a very different business to a lot of other tech and and um enterprise organizations out there but they're not mm. the only ones going through this kind of a rationalization let's say yeah yeah no exactly exactly um I think with um, I think with these guys, it's purely a case of trying to work out, you know, um, I, I, I guess what their what their goal is, where they're getting to. I think, yeah, podcast is definitely the next way forward, um, and also, you know, deep AI, um, you know, this sort of stuff. Is there a market? Oh well, yeah, their D they D their DJ so, thing. The, yeah. The, that recommends you music is getting more and more kind of on point with the stuff that it recommends. It's less kind of like, yeah. you know, you've listened, you've listened to Nirvana. So here's chili peppers. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Going, well, that yeah. doesn't really work. It's yeah. getting cleverer and actually serving up for stuff like that. Discovery piece is really absolutely. Clever. So you can yeah. see that, that that would be a kind of a, a benefit to a user to be like, okay, this is helping me discover music and it's yeah. quite interesting and quirky and is on point. Exactly, and I think that's great. To be honest, I think yeah, hundred mm. percent. Let Let's but, see, eh? Daniel, you've still not got a quiche. <laughs> <laughs> he hasn't, and uh, I mean, I don't know if he's gonna. I don't know if he's too crazy to get me on board, but you know, you, <laughs> let, let, let's see, let's see. I'm an Apple Music man, and I get laughed about it every time I tell anyone. So uh -huh. you know. Yeah, exactly. You do you, Akish. You do you. Thank you. Originality. Allow me to, you know. Oh yeah, being an Apple Music. That's 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 original. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> well, oh, he hasn't anyway. got me. He hasn't got me and Steve Cook. There we go. Yeah, there's two people he definitely hasn't got. Um, but yeah. Steve Cook isn't he? Is he a Bournemouth footballer? No. He's Who's a, Steve Cook? He's the Apple CEO. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I thought Come that was on. Tim Cook. That's Tim, Tim Cook, Cook. yeah, yeah, That's Tim Steve Cook. Cook. God, yes, <laughs> me and TC, anyway. I think right. Steve Cook is a ball, but anyway. Yeah. Um, anyway, right. let's stop there. <laughs> on Thursday, we'll, uh, sorry, not on Thursday, we've got a new schedule, David. On Friday, we'll be back talking about the fact that we are drowning in plastic, the amount of plastic in our oceans, and asking how technology can help. That is with Clean Hub. But until then, thank you for listening. Tech Talks is hosted and edited by David Savage. It is produced by Nash Squared. And we have special thanks to Lemzy for supplying music to this show. <laughs>